This week's story took place in the early 80s in the state of New York near the town of Stormville at a maximum security prison called Greenhaven Correctional Center. Donna Pion was 31 years old and a 5 foot 3 inch blonde who weighed around 130 pounds. A lot of people wouldn't have been brave enough to take on the job she did, which was a corrections officer who looked after some of the most vile and violent criminals that New York had to offer. She was a good person according to all those who loved her. She was a caring mother to her three children, a great sister to her siblings and a loving and caring daughter to her parents and the love of her husband Leo's life. Both her father and husband were both corrections officers as well at other nearby prisons. According to those who knew her, Donna pondered, why work for minimum wage when I can make three times that working in the prison? After completing a super short training period of only three weeks, she went on duty far too soon and was unprepared for the job in which she took. When her job started at Greenhaven, they would train her by switching up her assignments. For a while, she would be on one post, where she could get an idea of that job and she would be moved onto another post to learn that one as well and so on. On May 15, 1981, she began her shift just like the other days of her short time there. Her shift began overseeing the inmates going back and forth to the chow hall. At her command post, a phone call came in that was witnessed by another guard who overheard the conversation. She said that it sounded as if an African American man speaking and that they asked Officer Pion to report to the chaplain's office immediately. Donna, understanding that when a superior officer makes a request, it must be done right away, so she sat off toward the office to see what task was needed of her. When she got there, much to her horror, she realized that it was not a fellow officer or superior that made the call, but a bloodthirsty inmate who had access to the phone. The next few minutes would be the worst and last of Donna's life. Her shift was to be 1 to 9 pm that day and the call came shortly after she reached her first post of the day which would have made it sometime shortly after 1.30 when she sat off towards the chaplain's office. As time went on, several of her co-workers could not reach her, but she wasn't reported missing until after 6 pm. As soon as they failed to locate her, the prison was on immediate lockdown. Every cell door was closed and the search began for the missing officer. The prison was searched from one end to the next, from top to bottom. Some of her fellow officers started to wonder if she hadn't left the prison grounds on her own accord, but after reviewing the security camera footage from every entrance, it was soon determined that she did not leave the prison at any of the possible entrances or exits, so where could she possibly be? The answer would soon come when they checked a garbage truck who had just delivered a load from the prison to the land field. As they spread the trash out to search it, they found a plastic 50-gallon drum with a lid on it. When they removed the lid, they found the missing officer wrapped up in several trash bags and stuffed inside the barrel. Not only was she deceased, but it was obvious that she had been horribly assaulted both physically and in other words we can't use on this channel. The tip of her left breast had also been bitten off. Her face had cuts and bite marks all over it. Who could have done such a horrible thing to such a nice person? Convicted serial killer and rapist Lemuel Smith. When doing research for this story, I found it very difficult to find hardly any photos of most of his victims. I apologize for that. I did find a couple though. Smith was born on July 23, 1941 in Amsterdam, New York to what those who knew him called a very religious household. Smith was in and out of trouble from an early age and seemed to have a deep-seated hatred for his mother for some reason. By the time he was 10 or 11 years old, he had already tried to murder a fellow student, a little girl by smothering her. Thankfully, he was unsuccessful in his attempt, but that wouldn't always be the case. On January 21, 1958, Dorothy Water Street was robbed and beaten to death near Smith's home. All the clues pointed to Smith who was 16 at the time, but not enough evidence was there for a conviction. If he had done it, he again got away with it. He knew the police would be watching him very carefully though, so he decided to move to Baltimore, Maryland. It wasn't long before he was up to his old tricks.
He soon kidnapped and assaulted another 25-year-old female and after assaulting her, he nearly beat her to death, but before he could, he was caught by an eyewitness. This time he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was paroled after only serving 10 years. He moved back to his home area that year in 1968. On May 20th, he kidnapped and assaulted a woman who managed to escape. Later that same day, he kidnapped and assaulted a 46-year-old friend of his mother's. When the woman convinced Smith to let her go, he was arrested again and eventually sentenced to 4 to 15 years in a New York prison. He was paroled again in 1976 after only serving 4 years and I bet you can't guess what he did next. Take a wild guess. He was only out barely a month and on the day before Thanksgiving, yep. He did it again. Robert Hederman, 48, and Hederman's secretary, Margaret Byron, 59, were found murdered in Hederman's religious store in Albany. Human feces was found at the scene where he had literally taken a blank at the crime scene was there as well as some of his hair which was all used as evidence. Just a few weeks later while police were investigating the murders, another young woman, Joan Richburg 24, was assaulted, murdered and mutilated in her car at Colony Center Mall. Some of the injuries to the body as well as hair evidence matched the other crime scene. They knew Smith was their man but he was free pending the investigation. Just two weeks later on January the 10th of 1977, an elderly woman and her granddaughter who was 22 year old, was shopping at a nearby gift shop where a large tried to lure the younger woman out to his car. Obviously, she said no, so the man grabbed the elderly woman and pulled her from the store, threatening to kill her unless the young woman would get in his car. Luckily Hope showed up in time to scare off the would-be attacker. But as he was about to flee the scene, he knocked the elderly woman to the ground and stomped on her hand, crushing and breaking several of her bones. When she saw a photo of Smith a few years later, she said that he was indeed the man who had attacked her. By now, all three investigations were stalled due to lack of evidence. The police were doing all they could, but it wasn't enough. On July 22, 1977 he'd strike again. Mara Lee Wilson who was only 30 years old was found strangled and mutilated near train tracks in downtown Schenectady, New York. This was one of the areas that Smith frequented. A witness who had seen the assault take place described her attacker to a T, it was a description of Smith yet again. You think they would take him off the streets by now, but nope. Not before allowing him to attack again. August 19, 1977. Marianne Maggio who was only 18 years old, was kidnapped and assaulted by Smith. When he forced her to drive towards Albany after the attack, police stopped the car and arrested Smith. Shortly after the arrest, New York State Police Lt. Don Pinto, looked at photographs of Marley Wilson and noticed that a mark on her nose might be a bite mark. Wilson's body was exhumed and the bite mark was positively matched to an imprint of Lemuel Smith's bite pattern. Around the same time, in late October 1977, Smith was transported by police to Bleecker Stadium in Albany. He and four other men were randomly placed behind five screens at one end of the stadium. At the other end of the stadium, a police dog was given the scent of the feces-stained clothing from the Hederman store murders 11 months prior. The dog crossed the entire stadium directly to Smith. Out of sight of the dog. The five men were randomly rearranged and the experiment was repeated with the same result. It was successful a third time as well. Soon after, Smith confessed to all the murders, including the one 20 years earlier. He tried blaming all kinds of things on his actions. He tried blaming his parents for being too religious. He tried blaming a multiple personality disorder and even claimed that the spirit of his deceased brother was the one who committed the murders. The court saw right through his idiocy. He was sentenced to another 50 years to life. Afterward, Smith was indicted for her murder. He was also indicted for the murder of Joan Richburg after confessing. Since there was already no chance of him ever leaving prison, the indictments were dismissed. After the attack on officer Donna Pion, it didn't take long to discover who was to blame. 
Not only was he the only one to have access at the chaplain's office that day, his bite marks matched the bites on Donna's body. Even with all this, it still didn't prevent people like Al Sharpton from coming to his defense and playing the race card. It didn't work, thankfully. Smith had high-profile civil right attorneys William Kunstler and C. Vernon Mason, the latter of which was disbarred in 1995. The skeezy attorneys tried to put Pi on herself on trial by claiming that she was promiscuous. They even tried to blame corruption of the other prison guards at Green Haven for killing Pion over her seeing something she shouldn't have. Neither defense worked. They couldn't get past the bite mark evidence and even their own expert witness sided with the prosecution. Smith was sentenced to death. Once again, though, he found a way out of it. He filed an appeal stating that it was unconstitutional and he won, which gave him another life sentence. Smith spent the next 20 years of his life in near isolation, the longest such span in the nation at the time. Smith is incarcerated at Five Points Correctional Facility where he'll hopefully do the right thing for once and die already. To this day, on or about May 15th each year, correction officers gather at Green Haven Correctional in Stormville to remember Donna Pion. May she rest in peace. Pion is the first female officer to ever be killed in the line of duty at any prison, and one of only two to die at Green Haven. In the early 90s, another male guard who had tower duty, entered the tower and secured the door locked and he ended up committing suicide there by gunshot. If you enjoy what we do, please, hit the subscribe button and like our videos. It helps us more than you could ever know. We'll see you again next week. Till next time.